put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Moon review of I'll always know what you did last summer. Always, even though it's only last summer, so presumably the fisherman is now controlling the stream of time and can pause it, so it'll always be last summer. I already went into, with, with the second one, you know, still no. In the first one, it makes sense. I know what you did last summer because the events of the film are taking place one summer after the thing that they did that the person knows that they did the moment you have a sequel and you call it something like i still know it's no longer last summer though it's it's now two summers ago so you should really instead just you know just say the summer of you know i I figure the, you know, still know should have been called, I still know what you did, summer of 96. You know, that must be roughly when the events that they, you know, that the fisherman still knows took place. So, you know, and in, in this case, I guess, 05, because, you know, I, it's, it's again, I don't know if the majority of the film, you know, the, the year after it happened is taking place in 06 when it came out, or if it's supposed to mostly be taking place in 07, but let's go with 06. The the fishermen will always know what they did, summer of 06. See, instantly it sounds significantly less stupid. It's the 4th of July. We are in Utah, in what I'm, I'm not sure it's stated but it looks like it might be a resort town you know this small town kind of thing you know you've got mountains you've got like gondola lifts you know it's it's isolated you know quaint and we have some high school kids stuck in this small town having fun We've got one couple and then two friends, a male and a female. And using what is supposedly the original Ben Willis hook, they stage a prank of a fisherman attack. Because kids, there's a lot of that in this. They do this, of course, in order to stage a skateboard stunt which they could easily have set up without using the fisherman prank. Because kids, yeah. The kid doing the skateboard prank dies and the the the, the four decide to let the cops believe that this was a fisherman attack rather than you know, yeah, stating that it just went wrong because it would ruin their lives if people knew, you know, they would they would have like a police record or stuff. I, I don't know exactly what they think would happen because it is, you know, I mean, and say what you will about the first. It was, it was pretty ridiculously stupid how they got themselves in the situation that they got themselves into. But if they did tell people, hey, we ran over a guy, I mean, the moment, yeah, yeah, whoops, that's, that's, that's gonna get you a police record. Nevertheless, they make a pact not to tell anyone. The secret dies with them. Fast forward about a year, you know, we, we start in July 1st, so it's, you know, we're approaching, it's, it's, what what did nostalgia chicks say about you know the the Independence Day? We know that Roland Emmerich knows about the three act structure because in Independence Day he was nice enough to 
you know, give each of them a, you know, a, a day that it was set on. The four have lost touch in, you know, the, the secret has taken its toll on them, although some in, in different ways, and they didn't quite, you know, get the, the fancy successful future that they hoped for. They didn't really make it out of this town. Yeah. It's almost a remake of the first one, you know, although it, it, it really isn't supposed to be a remake. It's just, you know, it's just remarkably similar, including some dialogue. Like, literally, both this and the first have a scene where the two girls are sitting in a car, and it's, they're, they're you know, they're, they're maybe trying to reconnect, and it starts with one of them saying, what happened to us? Like, literally, it's, yeah, not just figuratively. Now, someone starts leaving them messages, including 50 text messages, because kids, and they are stalked, and, you know, clearly someone knows what happened, and they're trying to scare them, and the thing is, exactly how far is just gonna go with the fisherman, because whoever is doing this is wearing the fisherman slicker coat, raincoat. So how far is this fisherman willing to go to scare them, to maybe get back at them for the death? of the skateboard kid. The in in these three films, it's always why is the fisherman, whoever he is, going after the friends rather than just the four involved? And in this, not everybody likes the explanation, and it is admittedly pretty dumb, but there is an explanation in this one. And like with the first, and unlike the second, part of the drive here is the mystery. The, the four characters are trying to figure out, and we you know, along with them are trying to figure out who who is doing this. And in fact, you know, it could easily be one of the four. You know, the the first thing that happens is just that our protagonist, Amber, because small town, you know, she she's clearly being, you know, so, yeah, someone is leaving her messages, and so she goes to the other three and, you know, tells them, I got these messages, you know, someone knows, what are we going to do about it? And, yeah, I mean, it could be one of the four, the secret has taken its toll on them, and maybe one of them just lost it, and is, yeah, and maybe it's a family member of the the kid who got killed one of the family members is the sheriff of the town and he apparently already kind of didn't like the four he was maybe not the biggest fan of his you know i forget if it's yeah you know his his relative the, the friends that he kept, so, yeah. This does open with an intro that tries way too hard to be creepy and really, utterly fails. This is partially a sequel, but you really don't have to know anything about the first two. And there there is a connection between this and the first two, but it is very very tenuous, and really, the fact that there were two movies that came before this one is not even brought up until very late in this film. 
you know, I mean, if, it's, you know, this did come out eight years after the second film, so, you know, some of the, you know, some of the people who got to be, like, teenagers between, you know, in those, sometime in those eight years, probably picked this one up off the shelves at Blockbuster. Remember Blockbuster? Without knowing that always means that it's the third film in the series. And, yeah, that that really in no way, you know, I mean, the, the second film, for example, which did come out a year after the first one, really assumes that you watched the first one. It it kind of tells you what happened, but it really has nowhere near the effect if you didn't watch the first one. The the red herrings, you know, the, the amount and quality, they're, oh, they're okay. And there, there are for sure plot holes in this, but it does, unlike the second one, at least have a plot. I do not know this director from anything else. You really miss Kevin Williamson in this, and it lives down to a number of the slasher cliches that he pointed out in both Scream and the original I Know What You Did Last Summer. And that does make some of the more out there things a little harder to accept. But again, explained here, albeit arguably it's dumb. The, the writer of this, the, the, this takes itself fairly seriously, much like the first. And at some points to its detriment. The writer of this is known for doing unwanted sequels to genre films. And the the end twist in this one is genuinely utterly ridiculous. The I really got into the first two when they came out. You know, I got them on VHS very soon after they came out. I didn't watch them in the theaters. And I watched this about a decade later, so two years after this actually came out. And, you know, I I really, really like the first one. The second one is a lot of fun. And this one, yeah, I find it to be not too bad. So I may be what some people will consider to be inordinately kind to this film. As far as the cast goes, this features the 4400's Nikki. You know, Nikki. She was in seven of the 43 episodes. Mostly season one, because after that they didn't really know what to do with her. And, you know, I mean, if it's been a really long time, I, I only really watched it. I stopped watching it when the show stopped airing. I didn't really rewatch it after that point. But I did watch the entire show. And when you look up her name on the IMDb cast list, her name is right above the characters that you genuinely have to think hard to remember who they were at all. Like, there are characters who are really boring and pointless and forgettable that were in far more episodes than Nikki. And otherwise, this film, the, the cast, is nobody you know. Oh, and Dale from Alien vs. Predator Requiem, you know, Dale who shouldn't talk because he's too, he's too stupid to talk. The given that this is a Hollywood summer teen slasher and not one of the 90s ones, you kind of expect it to be packed with obnoxious, stupid, superficial youths partying. And really, it isn't particularly, I mean, there's a little bit of that, but it really isn't that, like, there's an early scene 
that is at a party, but it's not really like, ooh, look at kids partying. You like partying your kids. Enjoy this movie. It's really more that just it's a social function, and that's where... I believe her name is Brooke Nevin. Nikki. Amber in this. That's where Amber realizes that some of them maybe haven't actually left town the way that they hoped. Because a social function is where you realize something like that. And, yeah, I mean, our leads are largely likable. And, like the first two, this is very much a cast of pretty people. Pretty people looking pretty which makes their problems feel like pretty people problems. And that's really not... <sighs> I'm... To be fair, this, like the first two, is equal opportunity. There's one cute and one hot guy as well as girl in this. The characters really aren't particularly interesting. But unlike a lot of slashers, these really aren't like airheads. The, the major female characters are strong female characters. And we again have a strong female character in the lead, like in the first two. The acting ranges, but it has a tendency to be bad. It's, it's, it's never more than okay, for sure. The fisherman is played by a stunt stuntman stuntman so it's a very physical performance and the, yeah it really benefits from that and really the the characters tend to only be sexualized at parties or the like one of them's a musician and maybe musician is stretching she's she's the lead singer in a, you know, small rock band consisting entirely of young people. So, yeah. So when she performs, obviously she's, you know, dressed to impress. And, you know, Dale Colby in this, he's a lifeguard. So, yeah you know, he will be wearing lifeguard attire. Meanwhile, it's not shot like Baywatch. You know, it's, yeah, you know, looks attractive, but it's really just, I mean, they didn't necessarily so much make him, I mean, maybe part of why they made him a lifeguard is, oh, we can show off his six-pack then. But part of it is also, He's a lifeguard in a small town. He is never leaving this place. This film is actually pretty good for a low-budget straight-to-DVD film. And a sequel of that. It really, it is much more watchable than it has any right to be. The movie is 84 and a half minutes, not counting the end credits, and only 89 width, so it barely inches to feature length. And honestly, it's a pretty decent, like, you're not really bored for any of that time, so it does use its time well. The score is this really cool, fast rock music. You know, you'd, you'd expect Zoe, the singer, to be a much bigger part of that, but she only really... We see her practice once, and she plays one song, and then there's also, like, you know, at least one other rock band, but it's just, it's mostly score. And, yeah, it's, it's great. It's good listening, but... It doesn't necessarily really fit. It's it's another of these things where, you know, it's it's for kids, so we got to make sure that the music is really cool. And yeah, this is directed by a music video director, and this was his first horror film, and you can really tell because he really overstylizes 
some of it S significantly less than you might expect and that maybe like when you when you see over stylization in a genre film in the you know mid to late 2000s it's like oh joy one of these in this one it, i mean this is nothing like get carter for example that movie is just ridiculous obviously the stallone alone stallone one not the classic with and i forget his name but yeah definitely watch that version I'm, I'm not just saying if you're gonna watch either no, no, no. regardless of if you have any interest watch the original get carter it is fantastic anyway yeah it's surprisingly little of this that is really over stylized and really the sound work is pretty much consistently really good there's one part one part where it it transitions away from you know Colby the lifeguard at you know this this swimming what's it called yeah you know building where people go to swim it's not even a beach and like you know someone you know screams there as kids having fun are want to do and it transitions via like I guess an eagle is that also called a scream let's let's go with that an eagle screaming and then we're you know kind of in the mountains yeah that's a that's a pretty decent little transition the cinematography and editing is largely fine, but the framing is bad. And the over stylization is especially in these flashes that, yeah, they, they just, they're not scary. You know, flashing done well in, in the right context can be quite effective but not really in a slasher where the the fear is supposed to be that this guy's come and kill these people then then the flashing just distracts and calls attention to the fact that we are watching a movie it's not reality but yeah there's not that much of it overall and some of the scares really do work and there is real tension in this and the yeah the more quote-unquote classic approaches to horror work far better and thankfully that is most of the scares and this like the first two is an r-rated film and it really earns it you know you've got blood gore violence and not too much so it you know yeah, this was before the, the PG-13 was very common for the horror film, and it helps that it's direct to DVD. The, the feature, the, yeah, you know, the stuff you see at the cinema, yeah, they like to make horror films PG-13 so that more people can go and watch them. And, you know, and, and I do... I would say it doesn't have to be a bad sign that a horror movie is PG-13. The Ring is PG-13, but it's a bad sign if it is, say, a slasher. What The Ring does is it's psychological horror. There's almost no blood in that movie. The, the, the little blood that there actually is is like from the, the nosebleeds and such, you know. But a slasher, we are here to see blood and gore. That's part of the idea of the, the appeal. And this doesn't actually have nudity in spite of these not being like big names who don't do nudity. So yeah, that's 
slightly surprising. The effects vary, but most of them are pretty good, and the the makeup effects, the, the blood and such, are almost all practical. There's very little CG, and it just, you know, some people say, oh, well, either way, it's not real. Yeah, but if there's something physically there, even if it is, you know, created for the sake of the film, it still sometimes has more of an impact than just CG, which sometimes can end up feeling kind of, you know, weightless. Just, yeah. And the attacks and, you know, kills and such are genuinely memorable in this. This somewhat like the second has creepy men, although where in the second it is always these more older guys. In this, some of them are really not that much older than just the kids, but yeah, basically, you know, some of them are maybe into one of the girls, and the girls are really not into them, that kind of thing. And again, this really should feel like, I mean, this is some of this is maybe red herring kind of thing, you know, where if he's creepy, maybe he's willing to go to great lengths to scare these kids, maybe even more than scare. These guys are great at, I, I almost kind of want to see if these guys could do like the, the male, you know, romantic comedy or something, just to see if they're always that creepy, because Man, are they creepy in this. They just, the the little looks and the way they just, they keep looking a little too long at, like, you know, and the, the, the eye contact. And why did they show up there at that time? Are they, are they following her or are they, like, involved? Is, is he the fisherman? It's, it's, it works. It really does. And, yeah, this is significantly dumber than the first one, but also, you know, more fun, somewhat, somewhat like the, the second one. There may or may not be at least one dream sequence in this. And, really, a lot of the time, a lot of the, a lot of the way, this is more of a thriller than a slasher. So... More like the first and the second and that. And not all of the scares are jump scares, but it will make you jump out of your seat. And some of the jump scares are incredibly dumb. And this does have a body count and uses the hook well. It's just, you know, unbelievably sharp and, you know, cuts through flesh like it's just nothing and you know you've got some really great remember like you know slicing open someone's throat or slicing open a stomach and it does add maybe one or two interesting things to the franchise overall there are a ton of scares in this one like with with the with the second movie, it was very much, you know, I mean, we already know that the, the, there was a killer in the first one, and maybe he's back, you know, so it's kind of like, we're, we're really just waiting for them to take the fishermen seriously, and so it, you know, it has a lot of scares that don't really go anywhere, and this, as well, yeah, a lot of the scares don't really go anywhere, it, it just maybe adds another person to the list of suspects for the real identity of the fisherman. But, yeah, it, they, they work. These scares genuinely work. And, yeah, it's just, I mean, I don't think I have watched it since, yeah, 08, I guess. And I had completely forgotten how much fun this movie is. As long as you turn off your brain and... You know, as long as you're here for what the movie is, you know, 
if you're not shopping for what it's selling, obviously, but it wears it right on its sleeve. It has a dumb title. We already know the fisherman is right there on the cover. And the moment you have that overall title, it's yeah, it's gonna be the fisherman, you know, one way or another. And yeah, it's just it's it's way more fun than you might think. Being a small town in in Utah, in, in one of these states, there are remarkably few black people, and one of the only ones is in fact working as a waiter. So that's like, not the only one. I, I'm pretty sure I spotted at least one more, but yeah. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.